If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be vividly enthralling, and here's why. In this episode, we find answers to what is a simple thespian trick to help players feel something with our descriptions. And how can we use an easy checklist to generate engaging introductions? And what skills does it take to be a top-notch creative director for a TTRPG project? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm his brother, Jordan. So the main job of the DM, you just kind of throw some throw some words out there and, you know, build a world and yeah, you just throw some <laughs> throw some shit at a wall so that your players can interact with it. One of the main jobs is describing what you've cooked up in your head cuz I think this is one of the things I've fallen down the most with as a GM is doing all of this preparation and bringing so much to life in my own head. And then it's the communication of that to get everyone on board is where I fall down. And a bad introduction to something, a bad description, just makes it all fall apart instantly. Nobody cares what you've built because you didn't get them on board. (laughs) Yeah, that sits painfully inside the dark recesses of my heart is like laying down something that I felt was going to to really resonate with the players and like, oh yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to pull them in with this. And then it comes across like I'm reading it out of a textbook. Yeah, you kind of are sometimes if you're doing pre-written adventures. And sure, there's some box text, but so much of the time you're just like, there's six skeletons in this room. Um, Roll initiative. Right there. There is six skeletons in a room. (laughs) It is so like... There are six. <laughs> there are six skeletons in this room. Yeah, like that's that's how we need it to feel. There's so many questions. What are they doing in this room? Why are there animated skeletons? <laughs> There's so many things that we take for granted as GMs. So let I think we need an example of telling versus showing. Right. So the simple way that I've done before is saying the monster in front of you is terrifying. Or, yeah, like the lava river is incredibly hot. Like, I don't know how many introductions I've done like that. You know, it gets the players into this analytical mindset of like, okay, how do I how do I get across the lava river? Yeah. Or, you know, what am I going to use to fight this terrifying monster? Like, what do you say, Travis, to the monster is terrifying? Well, I say seven draws his twin swords. Right, ready to fight, ready to strategize. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Rather than, like, tentacles burst through the orcs that just threw open the doors in front of you, and their blood sprays all over you. Oof. Uh, I say Seven's w- eyes go totally wide as he turns to block the spray of blood moments too slow, and he goes, fuck! And he wipes the blood out of his eyes from the tentacle explosion. And from there, I can easily go, and now I draw my twin swords, but now I know that my character is covered in blood, and holy shit, this thing in front of me is way more dangerous. Like, this is magic. It seems simple, but holy crap, does it completely change the way that I approach games and these kind of descriptions and... Yeah, we're really excited to get to talk to the magician himself, our guest today. So we are pleased to welcome Olo Clark, a self-described Brit in L.A. and creative and art director for Escape Plan Games, a trained and talented thespian software engineer, man of many talents. An all-around creative and wonderful man who, after a Herculean effort, recently finished Tavern Tales Volume 1 with some of our previous guests, Colin and Mike from Escape Plan Games. It's a tavern, it's classes, it's items, and an adventure anthology, all focused on a circus-themed tavern called A Trip Away Inn, 
and uh, just a truly awesome creative project. Uh, welcome, Olo. Hi. Wow, what an introduction. There's no way I'm going to live up to any of that. I think, <laughs> let's, let's stop this now. I've got everything I need out of this. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Oh, wonderful. Very good. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and we can't, like, this, this topic is something, it's such a, a simple thing that has become just a game changer in my mind. It's truly a transformative thing for how deceptively simple it is. Yeah, I think it, it really is. I and mean, the revelation you've just been through is essentially what theater went through in the second half of the 19th century, <laughs> because that's when this sort of interior, more psychological idea of how actors should behave and get into character and that kind of thing, that's when this hit. So congratulations, you've, you've just lived through a transformation in performance right then in your own head. <laughs> So, but what I am hearing is that I'm a few hundred years behind in the curve. <laughs> you know, you've been a busy guy, I'm sure. Like, you can't you can't keep up with everything that's going on. There's a lot of skills we got to learn, Travis. You can't feel too bad. <laughs> so that's why we're making this podcast, so we can learn this stuff. At, at the heart of this, we're talking about the feeling of not understanding. And this is something that I myself have struggled with quite a bit, which is, players kind of leaning back in their chairs and there's this whole other conversation about like whether or not that's a bad thing. Cause like people participate differently. So I would put that, that disclaimer on this conversation that some people just like me in school just doodled, even though I was listening. So people kind of interact with the game, but there is this, like, they're not shocked when I am expecting them to be shocked. They're not scared when that they're expected to be scared or sad so where do you think that kind of comes from? Yeah, I mean, I think to your point about leaning back in the chair or doodling, everyone is invested in different ways, but you do want at least them to be invested. I've been thinking about this. I think one of the parts of this is slightly to do with 5e itself, as I understand it, which is 5e has been fantastic for inviting role play, but we need to sort of look at what 5e is broadcasting. At level one, you are orders of magnitude more powerful than a citizen of your town. A commoner is level zero. So at level one, you are already an extraordinary person. And I think 5e leans into that, right? You're playing a superhero, essentially. Like the Avengers can map into 5e very easily. Mm -hmm. So what is 5e broadcasting? 5e is broadcasting, be a hero. Make the heroic choice as you go. I think that's sort of the underlying message of it as a game in my opinion heroes when we look at them on like on the page or on screen or whatever they tend to wear their emotions quite lightly so what i think of as like heroic detachment like aragorn as a hero is a hero because he maintains this slightly brooding slightly loving slightly kingly slightly not kingly <laughs> position in the film at no point does aragorn ever just lose it you know when gandalf falls down he's going you know hills will be swarming with orcs we've got to go he doesn't sit and have like a deep breakdown about losing a semi-angelic being that's been helping them <laughs> save the world and and to be fair i don't think we want that from a lot of hero movies we don't want the avengers to become alcoholics and sort of just break down and shatter you know, even when that happens to thor it's sort of a light version of that you know what i mean yeah what what i'm getting to is when you, your players at the table if you say a terrifying monster comes over the hill the thing to do as a hero is not be terrified by that monster i think that's kind of at the heart of what we're talking about is it that heroic detachment means your players are leaning into combating the emotions you're trying to get them to feel because that's the heroic thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of it. Well, and then you've also got this side of role-playing and specifically 5e that is rooted in war games of, okay, my next move then is, I guess, draw my sword or prepare the spell or whatever. Right. It's not, how does my character feel about this? Yeah, exactly. Like 90% of the mechanics of D&D are about fighting. It's about strategy. And strategy is not emotional. Strategy is objective. 
um, you know, you guys did an episode on the fear mechanic and how fear is just a battlefield control spell. You know, it could just be called repel. It's just a force <laughs> field that keeps you however many feet away from me. And what does your player do? They edge around that perimeter as much as they can until it wears off and they can go back in. That's not fear. That's that's sort of magnets repelling each other. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it doesn't invite that within the game. It says at the beginning of the book, you know, role plays encourage kind of thing, but it doesn't dig into what that can mean. So do you think it's useful to encourage that emotional style of role playing within the fifth edition rules or like should we just be doing something other than fifth edition rules if that's the kind of game we want to play no i think you can totally do it i mean you know look at all the streams that are out there like i mean there are huge emotional arcs in so many of the 5e streams that are out there it's just that that's not immediately available to you in the way the rules for how to work out your hp are available to you and i think for you know for people who don't have a performance background like all the guys on critical role do that stuff isn't as intuitive as it maybe is to some of the people you're watching there's an element to streams in particular where they're probably on stream because they're quite good performers so there's already if you're watching it it's already different to your home game probably well that i can't think of a better setup because i want to learn how to play better like that Let's not waste any more time. Let's get into the strategy stateroom so that we can start to break this down. This is the strategy stateroom where inventive and cunning tactics are crafted for when they're needed most. So in this strategy stateroom, we're basically talking about how to get better at descriptions so that you can engage everybody at the table. And so in our conversations, we kind of got a few steps to run through and we're going to get more from our expert. But the basics are that you think about the purpose of your description. Think about if there's any actions you can add to it, if there's any sensations you can add to it, and if there's anything you as a DM outside of the fiction can add to it. Okay, so let's start with the first point, that purpose that you talked about, Jord. Although you say, what do I want my players to feel or learn? Yeah, I think one of the big pitfalls immediately is, as humans, there's this funny thing where if you tell someone something, it's something for them to analyze. Whereas if you provide them with an experience, they then have a reaction to that naturally. So like sticking with it, if you say a terrifying monster comes over the hill, you're immediately going, well, what's terrifying about it? Am I really terrified? You know, you've done the emotional lifting for them. Whereas if you say the thing that comes over the hill has ichor dripping from its teeth and blazing red eyes, you're giving them something to react to. So starting with that emotion, you can think about if that's where I want them to end up, what can I give them beforehand? Uh, when some, something you're taught as an actor is emotions aren't very Newtonian. It's not you get out what you put in. And a bad actor will often try and force an emotion in an audience by portraying that emotion. It's like whenever you've seen someone just crying, mm -hmm. you know, someone's in a, a quote unquote, a sad scene. So they want the audience to feel sad. So they just cry the whole way. And it just, it doesn't land. You know, watching someone try not to cry tugs at the heartstrings every time. Watching someone try and fight through that grief or that emotion, that invites us to sympathize. Whereas just watching someone go, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, like, I don't want to, I don't want to be in this right now. Interesting. So putting the emotion out there, being scary quote unquote scary is not going to scare your players providing a situation that results in being scared so when are we scared when we're out of our depth when we're suddenly alone or in a new place or we have no idea what's going on it's the lovecraft fear of the unknown thing so you want to provide those triggers rather than 
putting the mood, this is scary, out there. Got it. As a DM, really, before I start to introduce a location, a monster, a weapon, like any of these different areas, I need to think of what is it that I'm trying to convey to the players in essence. You know, if it's a shiny silver weapon, I need to try to accentuate that power rather than saying, this is actually a plus three hammer. I need to <laughs> I need to try to figure out ways of describing that power that is just inherent in its existence in the world. This thing practically vibrates. You feel your chest get heavy when you when you come near it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So sensation is always a good go to. Yeah, you know, everything other than sight, because a lot of stuff in D and D is descriptive. You know, particularly in combat. You know, your sword slices the orc's arm off. That's part of the job of a DM. Like there is a lot of description, but we've got a lot more senses than that. We've got taste, smell, touch. So yeah, any time you can put a taste in their mouth, you know, the sort of and there's a you get the taste of copper in the back of your throat as you walk near this sword. You know it's something tactile it's something visceral to react to and obviously with weapons i mean you gotta start with them being used you know this hammer in the hands of the local town champion you walk into the town square you see it swung and it just obliterates a brick wall you know i mean that's the that's the way to introduce a weapon yeah not just laying there on a table being all shiny yeah, just and on cool. a slab it's just be it's mm, that looks cool that yeah, that looks like it might be about plus two. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really great. And that's already starting to unlock some different ideas here. But the next point here is action. And I think we've kind of already touched on that, because like you just said, you know, you see the hammer swinging into uh, a brick wall. Is that is that kind of what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think anytime. Because as the DM, again, you're sort of, you're the, you're the god of the world. So if you say the bartender suddenly looks scared, that's canon. You know, they don't, your player doesn't have to do any investigation. But if you say, as you're talking, the bartender down the bar suddenly stops wiping for a second and then continues. Now you've given them something to go, oh, wait, why did that happen? And it's up to them to dig into that, you know, and you've got roll an insight check or whatever it is. But that it's, it's prompting something for them to engage with rather than just providing them the information. I mean, in fact, in, in, you, know, you talk about action. I want to talk about one of my favorite show don't tell moments of all cinema, which is from that great classic of the action fantasy love actually. <laughs> um, uh, so minor spoilers for love actually, if you haven't seen that 20 year old film, Emma Thompson's character finds a, necklace in the pocket of her ornery husband's coat coming up to Christmas and thinks, oh, you know, I've, he's coming round, he's softening, he's got me a lovely necklace. And then on Christmas Day, she unwraps her present and it's a Joni Mitchell CD. And she realizes that means the necklace is for someone else. Um, and then we cut to this scene. She goes upstairs and we cut to her sitting on the bed, crying quietly to herself, listening to Joni Mitchell. And then in one of the most I, I, as a Brit, it speaks so deeply to like British sensibilities. But as she gets up, she wipes her face. And before she leaves the room, she just straightens the duvet. She just flattens the blankets on the bed and makes sure the corners are nice. And in one moment, you have Emma Thompson's entire character explained. It's incredible. It's, you know, she's a provider. She soldiers on. She doesn't feel like she can talk, but she will get through this. And in the meantime, everything's going to be going as it was because I've got two kids and I'm a mum and that's my job and I'm going to be the best mum I can be. It's it's just remarkable. It gets me every time. Yeah, it's so subtle, but like she's removing any evidence of her emotional state. And weirdly enough, that does apply to the heroes of Dungeons and Dragons because I'm just thinking like everything you've said so far, players can use this to their advantage when they're going into that fight and they don't want to like go on a monologue or like you said, tell everyone, my character is scared. But instead, they show that little tiny glimpse of their interior emotional state, and then they do something to bolster themselves. So like, this is a, it's a great example, because this is something that players can use as well. 
Like it's not just a DM trick. And I think I certainly, as a player, you know, I I'm, I love the kind of fireside chat bits of a DD session. I love the at the end of the day, the PC is all sitting around and building story between each other. Not just like, okay, we begin our long rest, sleep time, HP back. <laughs> you know, I I love that kind of you know touching base because everyone's got that backstory they desperately want people to ask them about <laughs> um so like and, and and that's another exactly what you're saying of like if as a player you go okay you see my wizard radon suddenly look like he's questioning everything he's ever learned the academy has lied to him and you know he doesn't want any part of this anymore your fellow players you might think that you're inviting something by saying that you know a player going oh what's wrong but you've just told them everything that you're thinking. Whereas if you instead say, my wizard quietly snaps his wand in half and walks away, suddenly your other players are going, well, what just happened? Because they haven't got that, in, they've got the expression of the interior. You haven't just told them everything that's going on. Yeah, there's a curiosity there that you're just, you're not telling each other what to do next in their role play. You're just inspiring it instead That's and as great. another player i have to ask <laughs> what the hell that was about because yeah you literally just snapped a wand in half you quite and, and you as a player again quite literally have to ask which is already a step down the road of leaning in committing all that stuff 100 percent. that's that's great in terms of that filmic quality i can now see how many of my favorite films are doing things like this all the time and you kind of have to yeah show don't tell as a concept came from a misquote of anton chekhov of the seagull and cherry orchard fame and there's a, the, the the quote that isn't quite right but is much pithier than the reality he said something like don't tell me the moon is shining show me the glint of light on broken glass and he worked with Konstantin Stanislavski, who is really the father of performance as we know it now. You know, if you know, it, and it's so commonsensical now, but was totally revolutionary at the time. And you see this everywhere. And and and, and it's not even always a conscious thing. It's just good storytelling. Sticking with Lord of the Rings for now, like there's a scene in the Fellowship of the Ring where when the first Uruk Hai is born, it kind of emerges out of that horrible birthing sack scene the first thing that happens they open they rips his way out he grabs an orc by the throat and starts to choke it out two other orcs try to help but saruman just quietly keeps them back and watches what's happening the urukai breaks its neck and stands up and does the sort of big villain reveal you know and so not a single word is spoken but what have we learned from that scene the urukai are crazy strong, violent right out of the gate, but they're not chaotic killing machines. He doesn't just reach for everything around him. He stands up and stands to attention. So immediately we've, we've seen the birth of this Terminator-like killing machine that is controlled. We've seen orcs before. They kind of, they're rabbly and they run around and they're cowards, but this is something new. But it goes beyond that. What else have we learned? We've learned that Orcs have at least a sort of sense of empathy because the two of them try and help their buddy out. We learn that Saruman doesn't care you know, a toss about his underlings because he's <laughs> happy to watch one get strangled. Saruman is scientific. He wants to see what happens. You know, there's a one hand chokehold. He's got this thing in, but he wants to see if this will work. He wants to see it killed. And we learn that the orcs behind him are more scared of Saruman than they are interested in saving their buddy. So you have a whole socio-political personal structure going on in that one scene. And, and, and once you start looking for those things, once you start breaking down what films and movies and games are doing, you see it everywhere. It's, it's, it's totally ubiquitous. Well, to bring it back to D&D &D a little bit and what we can do as DMs, if we can get a little more specific on how to apply this to introducing the people in our world and like the NPCs and the villains and how to how to get that good introduction so that players understand what you're trying to convey with this person why are you introducing this person so for me I always love introducing an NPC by the players walking in on them doing a bit of business doing something that reflects 
who they are. Like I think of, you know, in movies, I think of like Bill the Butcher in when Leonardo DiCaprio meets him in the movie, he's gutting a pig. Pete Postlethwaite in the town, the like the villain of the piece, he's he's cleaning roses when you know our hero walks in. You know, and, it, and it's brilliant for even like merchants. You know, anywhere where you can physically come in through a door and see something happening. I love giving people something that they're eating when their players come in because the way people eat and what they eat feels incredibly representative. If you come into a you know silk merchant and the guy behind the counter is picking at a salad with a silver fork, you're immediately going to feel very different to that shopkeep as one who is tearing into a roast chicken with his bare hands, <laughs> you know, sl- grease everywhere, throwing the bones to the dog. You haven't met that person yet, but you can already get a sense of who these two different people might be. So business is a great thing to do. And obviously, and for villains as well, like, you know, every villain needs a good intro scene where they're sort of the TV trope of kick the dog. You know, then you meet them doing something utterly heinous or to flip it something really lovely and then we turn that on its head later yeah well i mean even going back to that you know let's say a silks merchant the difference between a silks merchant who's sitting at a table and like you said eating disgusting things right near you know their silks like that says a lot uh the fact that the shop is deadly quiet there's nobody around there. There's just bolts of cloth on shelves versus somebody who's standing up, eating a salad, directing all of their employees towards, you know, now you, now we've walked into a very, very different scene and we know everything about that character that we really need to know. Like, I'm scared of the first guy sitting down eating, you know, sucking chicken off a bone. Yeah, exactly. Why is his shop empty? You know, why is there no one in here? In the other shop, why is this one full of customers? You know, people are happy to be in this space. Okay, so it can't be too threatening. You know, all of these little things, they they add up and they're very subconscious, but we encounter them in real life all the time. Like we've everyone has been walking down a street late at night, seen that one person coming towards them and gone, you know what? No, I think I'm just gonna cross the road with that shop. Is it, you know, if is it prosperous? You know, if if a customer walks in. Are they thrilled to see that customer? Or are they doing loads of business already? Doesn't matter who you are, come in, buy something, don't buy something, I'm good. You know, all of those sort of attitudes. You know, and again, given circumstances, that merchant, he's not a um, uh, Truman show, you know, I'm standing still in this room until you walk in. He's got a life. So what happened to him yesterday? What's happening to him tomorrow? Has he got a big meeting? Has he just been shouted at by the king for not paying taxes? Has he, you know, is he in financial, is he in massive debt to a thieves guild? Is that on his mind? All these things happen before your heroes walk in and go, hello, we're the most important people in this story. You know, that it's all feeds into where they're going to be when you meet them. Wow. And you can use that to like pepper in the details of your world that you want players to know. That's amazing. It immediately makes me wonder how many things I've inadvertently conveyed. You definitely will be. Yeah, like going back to the the character that is sitting there sucking the meat off the chicken bone and in a in a quiet, empty silk shop, you need a large building to hold a whole bunch of silk. So if I've described all of that, now as a player, I walk in and I go, well, this is obviously a front. This person isn't doing businesses. There's <laughs> yeah. a there's a gambling ring in the basement. Like Yeah, there's no way you're shifting all of this stuff. Absolutely. And as a total side note, much harder to try and convince a group of D D players that someone is trustworthy. <laughs> much harder. You bring, you know, they walk into the town, a lovely little old lady with silken silver hair in a white gown greets them and say, Greetings, travelers, have some fruit from my orchard. There's no way they're (laughs) trusting that old lady. She might run the local charity, but you are never going to get them to trust her. I think that's why I really like that first question so much now that we're talking about it. What do I want my players to feel learned? Because I think that's been the missing step for me a lot of the time is sometimes I've, I've inadvertently done pretty well on these other points, but it's all random. It's like, oh, I want an interesting NPC. So I will randomly have them doing something and 
yeah, all these details that just create a jumbled mess. <laughs> I don't know what I want the players to do. <laughs> but I can immediately see how easy it is to start to apply the same kind of methodology to, say, monsters um, and how monsters are introduced and how locations are introduced. I can convey all I have to do is ask those first two questions. What do I want them to feel and, and see and hear and and convey and then what action is happening that i can describe that immediately gets that across and you know I, i'm i'm a big fan of creativity within those confines now that i know what i'm trying to hone in on i can much easier come up with some of those ideas exactly so like with a monster again think about how you want your players to react to this monster do you want them to think it's you know big and strong do you want them to think it's small and nimble you know have you got you know godzilla versus predator right you know how are those two different monsters established as scary in their own way so with godzilla what do we see we see the colossal shadow under the boat right yeah. you don't have someone on board going i've heard tell there's a massive sea monster around <laughs> you see you see the comparison. You see something that we know how big a boat is. We know how big a shipping boat is. And then you see the scale of this thing underneath versus the Predator, which is where you have a team of, you know, incredibly highly trained, very capable soldiers in the jungle. And then there's just something that they can't pin down. This team of incredibly yeah, honed and trained experts cannot get a handle on. That's why it's scary. Yeah, I remember an interview with Ivan Van Norman where he talked about the fantastic difference between Alien and Aliens 2. Whereas in Alien, you've got a bunch of you know space engineers versus something that is just a killing machine. In Aliens 2, you've got Marines, you've got trained soldiers, so the threat needs to be different. If one of the you know just one alien isn't going to cut it anymore. But a fantastic moment of show don't tell in Aliens 2 is when they set up the auto turrets in all of the vents and then they just sit and watch the bullets run out. <laughs> There's a tracker on each gun that has you know 9 million bullets in it each and you just see that number go down and down and down. And so what's happening is that number's going down. They're getting less and less safe. They are seeing a, an actual readout of how <laughs> little safety they have left. <laughs> it's so good. Rather than just a big gunfight, it's so much more effective. And as an audience going into that, we assume that there is an equal measure of skill and, and talent and badassery for the Marines as to to meet this alien menace that we saw in the first one. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, yeah, another 20, 30 aliens. These trained soldiers can do it. And yeah, like you said, as that bullet counter goes down, it's like you are in over your head. Yeah. You are absolutely effed. And, <laughs> and no ma no number of Marines is going to help this. Mm -hmm. and, and with monsters as well, kind of, your heroes are never going to be the first group to encounter this monster. You know, unless you have a demon pop into reality right in front of them, this thing in the woods has been out there for a while. You know, the local villages have adapted to life with this thing around. So you arrive at this village and suddenly there are tall wooden stakes put in around the walls, you know, and fires burning in a ring around town. You know, why? Like, what's the, what are those fires there for? You know, so there is, you can build history into your encounters before you meet the thing. You know, someone has met the creature before you have, and they are missing an arm now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can do that. Like, that works very well with horror and those terrifying monsters, but... I mean, that same principle could apply to just about any villain or NPC or ally. Absolutely. Yeah, like an ally could have been helping people beforehand. You want their help now. Totally. Yeah, you come around the corner and there's someone handing out bread to all the orphans of the village. You know, that's that's establishing that character as, you know, someone who's charitable, someone who isn't afraid to be out in public. They're not afraid for their own safety. 
you know they you know did they buy all this bread did they make it you know it, all these questions are turning up already and you've just seen one thing in action Go, going off that example i think something i do as well with my players is i use what i i don't know why but in my head i call a gremlin npc and a gremlin npc does not exist to do anything in and of themselves a gremlin npc exists to have something done to them <laughs> so it's it's the kid that runs out in front of the evil duke's cart and gets trampled because don't spare the horses you know we, or it's it's the guard it's the classic it's the guard who bursts in and shouts they're here before a sword emerges from his chest from behind him you know don't try and get your players to care about the gremlin they're not going to because they've only just seen this person but it's a person who triggers an event that your players can then react to. So a gremlin can be really useful to trigger something where you don't necessarily want your players to be in on the action, but you want them to see something happen. Boy, that's great. That is super powerful. And uh, yeah, you can, again, put a positive spin on that too. I'm assuming you can have, you know, that kid get saved by someone if you want to portray another do-gooder in the community. Yeah, I don't know what it says about me that I'm killing orphans on this <laughs> podcast. It's clearly, and I'm every, trying to save them. <laughs> every, exa every example I've got has definitely leaned towards the villainous. Yeah, entirely. You know, you can see when when this NPC walks out of the townhouse and starts walking towards the castle, a flood of gremlins go and chat to them and ask them for help or, you know, tell them, you know, my sick mother could really do with this. Or other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like that distinction, though. I think that'll help me. Because as a as a DM, sometimes I focus on the wrong details. So just reminding myself, like, that's a gremlin. Don't flesh him out. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give him a rich backstory. They have one hit point. You know, if your players try and talk to them, they just run away. <laughs> like, or or you can you can transpose a later NPC, you know, if they haven't been to the inn yet and they decide to talk to, you know, your gremlin, suddenly that gremlin can be the tavern keeper from later who next time they go in can go oh i remember you guys from you know so there's there's ways to agent smith matrix translate an npc onto a gremlin but you don't it, the point about a gremlin is not to try and build out a tragic backstory for them they're going to be used and thrown away yeah yeah or alternatively when the players are grasping and starting to pull in a random npc that you've thrown in as uh you know someone that they're trying to like pull into their party or you know when players get a little overly <laughs> attached to the rando that you threw in then the sword goes through them the monster attacks mm -hmm. the, yeah. <laughs> now you're in combat because you almost tried to make friends again damn it you fools stop talking to people you get them killed <laughs> good lesson moving on to some of the other points that you'd brought up you mentioned how you use sensations yeah i mean so the, the obvious way to use them is in environments think you know what's the temperature is it humid is it you know is it dry you know what are they tasting and feeling is there that kind of you know if you're in a desert there's that sort of you've got dust in your teeth versus you know if you enter a kind of new orleans you know tropical town you're drenched in sweat the second you step outside those sort of tactical things really help sort of people get into what they're supposed to be feeling you know if you just you walk into town if you just say that your players haven't got any input they sort of okay well i get we stand in the middle of the street until something happens <laughs> but if you walk into a town and you see people walking their coat collars up arms wrapped around themselves, heads down, you know, yeah, they want to be outside for as little time as possible. They're just hurrying indoors versus people in, you know, nice flowing summer dresses, chatting and, you know, laughing to each other in the streets. Those are two very different towns already. Sensation works for NPCs as well. You know, someone comes into the tavern, you know, shoulders up, knocking snow off their shoulders and immediately runs to the fire and starts warming themselves. Okay, it's snowing outside. You, you've done that without having to say, and you see it snowing outside. And that gives those players something to then react to. Because like what you're kind of describing, the danger as a DM, and I've done this myself plenty, where I said, you feel the cold bite into your skin. In, inevitably, 
there is a player at the table that goes, but I have resistance to cold. Mm-hmm. Or I have scales, <laughs> yeah. not skin. Yeah, no, I, I feel that. And going back to what we said, that's a heroic decision. Yeah. That's them conquering the cold. So it's a very natural, you know, that's not, I, I want to be very clear, like the, the danger of this sort of heroic detachment is it's not about players being snarky or not trying to get involved. They are getting involved. They are committing. They're committing to the heroic, which 100%. is I can beat this. You know, I can transcend what I've been given. I got so you. exactly that. If you say it bites into your skin, half of your group, more than half, are going to go, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. you know, because, I, because, I'm, because I'm not going to be, you know, knocked down by a little snowstorm. And that's them engaging with your game, but they've analyzed what you've told them rather than connected with what you've shown them. And if you, you know, going back to your gremlins, if you show 30 gremlins being frostbitten, then by the very nature of them not doing anything, they're being heroic, like just standing there while everyone else is freezing to death, even if they're not role playing at all is okay. My character feels a little bit heroic. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. I love it. The power of those gremlins is really, really kind of transformative in the sense that Anything that you want to convey that like anytime I have that kind of gut reaction of like you wipe, you get the dust out of your mouth because this is a dusty desert um, and you're spitting sand. out. Well, I can't do that because then I'm dictating what your player is doing, but I can introduce Mm -hmm. a gremlin who's just constantly wiping the sand out of their mouth and having to cover their mouth to stop that from happening. That conveys plenty. Absolutely. Or they meet nomad tribe who are all wearing wet cloths across their mouths. You know, there are people who can, who have adapted to what you're up against everywhere you go. And now I, as a player, am going, well, what am I, how am I affected by this dust? Oh, um, I'm either going to adapt or I have this heroic thing and I'm just going to stand in the face of this dust. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. And like you mentioned before, you're, causing players to take the bait and to react to what you've set up and boy that's that's some powerful stuff take the bait is a very good way of putting it yeah absolutely and we're almost touching on this last piece of the meta that players are leaning into like we are playing a game we aren't actually these people so there's always going to be the meta of what's happening and you had brought up some really interesting points around things that you as the DM can do to convey certain feelings and emotions um, just by your DM presentation and how you're behaving at the table. Yeah, I think something that doesn't get talked about very much is the role of the DM. And I don't mean, I don't mean, you know, organizing sessions and preparing notes. I mean, at the table, I've always thought there's an element of the stage magician to being the DM, you're behind the screen, you're the only one who knows what's going on. And like, I think we've all, everyone's probably found at some point or another, the difference between responding to a player question with, um, good point, uh, let me think, uh, uh, I don't know, actually. The difference between that and a wry smile and just telling your players, you don't know. You know, the difference between those two things is playing a role it is the mercurial you know arch <laughs> behind the <laughs> behind the screen versus your friend chris who suddenly has you've clearly done something he wasn't prepared for <laughs> <laughs> and he's now winging it but like i think a, an aspect of that is is making marking the difference between a place they've just gone because they've said they've gone there and a place they've gone that is now important and i think it can be as subtle as you look down at your notes and you start to you change your vocal timbre a little bit. You start to talk slightly more differently. And again, like in a, in a real life show, don't tell moment, your players go, oh, we're somewhere he's got notes for. This is real now. And they're going to lean in and this is they're going to know that this is a place to explore. You know, that this is how you get them to actually spend time in that dungeon. You've spent four days putting magical items around. Um it's so it it translates into the performance of the DM as well, I think. Yeah, that's such a such an undervalued part of the whole experience, because you're right. Like, I'm just thinking back to all of the times that the players at the table 
are reading my body language and they're trying to figure me out rather than the game. And I'm like, stop, don't look at me. Listen to what I'm saying, you fools. <laughs> but you can use that, you know, particularly, I think like, especially something I have found if, uh, if you want to communicate, like we've all had those combats where your players aren't taking your awesome combat as seriously as you wanted them to. So like you, you can start to get, especially if they start to get low on hit points, you can get like serious. I think behind the screen, you can go, you take another 2d6 of damage. You can really start to lay the dread of like, oh, I could die here. Yeah. Right. You, know, you can lead them there without going, you take this seriously. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I spent a long time on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So all of what we want to do is we want to see this in action. So in our Discord, we actually turned, and this is a fun little surprise for you, we turned to our Patreon supporters and we asked in Discord, hey, give us some examples that we can layer on show, don't tell on top of. So we started with four categories. We asked for a character, a monster, a location, and a weapon. And so if your game... What we'll do is we'll try to just translate this kind of live uh, with the three of us and we'll we'll see what we can come up with in terms of turning something that could be tell into something that is show. Are you, you game to do that? Absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Well, the first one is from Will HP. Uh, this is a character and he says, meet Kenneth. He's a human villager from the hamlet of Schmucklesby who has recently found work as a Tanner's apprentice. He has recently mastered the delicate art of evenly spacing holes and belts and <laughs> hopes to someday fashion a haversack. <laughs> Big goals. Excellent. So that's like, that's a typical character backstory. We need to now convey all of this as if our players are first meeting Kenneth. A big interesting something we haven't touched on but a, a really great aspect of show don't tell that's very common in fantasy and everything you know in, in many other worlds as well is names names are fantastically useful which is not the reality in the real world you know mass murderers have the same names that everyone else does but in everything from sort of dickens onwards think of any dickens novel if you have I know I'll go back to orphans again. I don't know why. And there's all orphans <laughs> with me today. But you know, you're an orphan and you have, you know, bachelor uncles you could go and live with. You could go and live with Uncle Pinch, or you could go and live with Uncle Chucklebottom. You know, <laughs> one of those is already more appealing. Like I haven't you haven't said anything about those people, but those are evocative names. So in the sort of fantasy setting, I hear Kenneth, and I think Kenneth is a good bloke. I think Kenneth is a excitable, not particularly cool, warm-hearted. He's a in my head, he's a big dude. He's very excited and driven about what he's do doing. I love the delicate art of evenly spacing holes and belts. <laughs> like if only a tanner could get excited about this. I think that's a very important place to start. This is the kind of thing that no everyone else just wears belts. So he's the only one who's going to be excited about this. So where do we start? Let's start with the sensations, right? He's a tanner. So the tavern door bursts open as from outside you hear the words, Kenneth, for God's sake, wash your hands. <laughs> and a huge man comes in through the door and you are met with the stench of tanning oil and rot and hide and dirt as this man blunders right up to the bar and holds something up to the bartender and says, look, did it <laughs> look that's so good wow look here's a belt okay why is that so significant like i need to talk to kenneth now about why he's holding a belt to the bartender so excitedly yeah. um because clearly like it's yeah. an achievement kenneth doesn't knock kenneth doesn't wash his hands <laughs> kenneth doesn't check who's in the room before he comes in you know, he's too excited. He's, he's worked out how to evenly space holes. And that is the best day of Kenneth's life. <laughs> and that's great. That's awesome. I think if the, the players are kind of meeting this character for the first time uh, in their space too, you know, what I kind of saw with Kenneth 
like he's an apprentice so i can maybe convey that with brand new tools they do not look nice well used and he's got them all laid out yeah because like he has not like the 30 year veteran of tanning and crafting who has just the a shop is a mess he's brand new at this so he still has that like fresh new eyes and he's got them all perfectly laid out or maybe in a little tool roll that is you know nice and clean he doesn't know what they all do yet yeah he's he's just kind of studying yeah. one and like looking back and forth at it i wonder which one this one does <laughs> as your players come around the corner you know into the into the you know into the square they hear that's a peen hammer not a claw hammer <laughs> you know and, Exactly. Like this, this uh, disembodied <laughs> critical voice <laughs> just following him around. Yeah. <laughs> There's your gremlin. Like you know, your gremlin is the master tanner who is only there to tell us that Kenneth is a little incompetent. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And that that person can just vanish. You know, they don't need to ever be seen again. The next one is from Micah Fish, uh, and he gives us Timothy the reformed question mark thief who does seminars on how to secure your castle or manor from people like me. That's amazing. I love the reformed question mark. Yeah, exactly. A seminar on, this is how to put all the things in your house that I know how to break. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, immediately this is a con. Like this is 100% a con. So what does that tell me about Timothy? He's sly, he's sneaky, but he's doing this out in the open. He's running a seminar. He's a performer. If he's running a seminar, he's got to be good in front of people. So he's got to be charming. He's got to know how to run a room. So, you know, your players walk past an inn with a sandwich board outside that says, for one day only, you know, Timothy walks you through how to keep people like him out of your house. So the seminar is happening. So what happens? Your players walk into a room. There's your fantasy version of a spotlight on a very charming, lithe figure in an open neck shirt, and 40 people are hanging on his every word. You know, <laughs> but you don't say that. You say 40 people are in dead silence as this man talks. So we're establishing he's someone people want to listen to. He's, he, his seminars are working. You know, there's a very, it's a very different thing between a seminar packed with people and a seminar with two people in the second row. You know, that's telling us different things about this person already. Maybe he's just on a stool looking incredibly shy and doing his equivalent of I found Jesus and now I need to tell you, you know, about <laughs> the hor- the horrible, horrible things I did to people. And this is how you stay safe. You know, maybe he's playing that angle. Heart yeah. to heart. Yeah. Yeah. I I kind of immediately saw, like, if I want to convey to my players um, you know, that likability, maybe he's a contact that they're needing information from. I picture that Tony Robbins type of personality <laughs> where he's just like shaking everyone's hand after the seminar and signing Ooh, some yeah. autographs. And then, Very touchy-feely. But he doesn't really give a shit about anybody, but he's choosing his mark. You know, he's got that last line of, Make sure you upgrade that safe like we talked about. Don't keep it in your underneath your bed. Move it to the closet. Upgrade that yeah. safe and you'll be good to go. And then just immediately mm-hmm. continues to shake like the player's hands, the, the player character's mm-hmm. hands. Well, what about uh, let's move on to monsters. We have the first monster from Lila. Um, and our prompt was, and Lila delivered, simple. Because simple is how often... I have stumbled in the past with introducing monsters. You see a purple worm. Uh, And in this case, (laughs) Lila delivered, you see a skeletal dragon. This is, I think, very ripe for show, don't tell. Right, and it's where DMs start from. You get the name in the book. And right there, that I think, that's something I've shifted and has had a huge effect because I've got a couple of people at my table who've been playing forever. Right. And they know the monster and they DM, they know the monster manual. You know, if you say you've got a lizard man, shaman, they in their head, they're going, okay, CR2. (laughs) It's got, you know, kind of things. I, I never call the thing the name it is in the book. Just describe it. You know, if they can figure out, you know, if they're a ranger and they want to do a nature check on it and realize that it's a lizard man, fine, great. But why start with the out of the box 
computer game, you know, villain that is exactly the same as the one standing next to it. Go for the physicality, go for the, go for the effect it has. Have a gremlin being torn in half as you arrive or a gremlin who suddenly you know, the flesh melts off their bones, but you don't see anything around them. Um, so for example, in this case, like I immediately go, I think it's particularly with a big, with something that's potentially like BB EAG of a, of a, maybe a mini arc, like a skeletal dragon's a pretty hefty yeah. thing. You know, you're not just going to stumble across that build the lead up, you know, geographically and kind of the impact it's had, um, you know, Medusa's lair is full of stone statues before you ever find Medusa. Mm-hmm. You don't just meet Medusa and she turns one of you to stone. So with this, my immediate thought was, okay, your players move through a dragon graveyard with three colossal dragon skeletons in various poses of, of pain and, and war to get somewhere else. And on the way back, there's only two skeletons now. <laughs> good Very stuff. good. So immediately, what's that established? That's established that something unnatural is happening here. You know, a skeletal dragon is a very, is a sort of rejection of everything that is normal about life and death. So suddenly there's only two skeletons. And then you hear the beating of wings high above you, disappearing towards the town. And at the very least, if you're about to go into that BBEG fight, you've got, like you said, the skeleton has disappeared. There is now gore and viscera all over the place. And there is a creature, our gremlin, in this case, a, an actual gremlin of a goblin, who's running towards you, but past you. Yeah. And is yes. like trying to GTFO. <laughs> and That's fantastic. Yeah. And a scary thing being scared is always very unsettling. I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the band of gnolls passes you on the road, <laughs> going the opposite direction. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> the next one is from Dangerous Marmalade. They've provided Yazik, a demon horse with blades for legs that skins the souls <laughs> of unwary folk, leaving behind naught but walking husks. I feel like I've seen this heavy metal album cover. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah, some great language in there to start with. Skinning the souls. Love it. So, I don't know. Demon horse, blades for legs. <laughs> That's some weird tracks to follow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, if you want if you want to draw attention to the fact it's got blades for legs, let's start with going, what the hell has this thing got for legs? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's you know that's brilliant. And then yeah, you're right. You find you find an abandoned cart on the road with you know the town blacksmith who has just been flayed. A look of revulsion and horror on his rigor mortis face. He's seen something that has scared a blacksmith again. Like like the scary thing being more scared. Something very capable that's been very killed is again always fun to start with. And they've already given us the. Uh gremlins in this scenario the husks walking down the road past you the soulless husks oh yeah, I, yeah so i didn't even pay i didn't even pay attention to that part i just i was i was on legs <laughs> yeah so in, in so now so you, you're following these tracks you get to the top of a hill and outlined in the moonlight is a familiar shape shuffling towards you but you all know that barrington the town smith walks with a jaunty gait his shoulders are down his head is lowered and his silhouette slowly moves towards you you know okay what's going on (laughs) this smell wafting on the air there's uh there's there's the the silhouette of the demon horse rearing um with blades on its (laughs) legs in the distance (laughs) like there's so many you can hear the the death whinny of of this terrifying horse off in the distance yeah the slice clop this (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> whatever that sounds like uh let's let's try to do this with some locations so we have a couple more here we've got locations and weapons let's talk uh mycofish submitted that location is likely a border town one of the places where you have a feed store a funeral home a bar uh 
and that one building keeps getting bought and resold every few months. Sometimes it's a bait shop, a few months later it's a discount clothing store, and sometimes it's a community co-op where weird people show up to sell weird stuff. <laughs> Just because the owner can't figure out anything actually profitable to do with at any of those times. So that's that's a lot of backstory to convey about this town. But you're making me think already going through your first step is like, what do you want to convey? Well, you want to convey that it's not a huge profitable community, right? Like that's the intent. Yeah. There's no reason for people to stay here very long. So you don't have loads of houses. You don't have loads of infrastructure. The people here, you know, are in traveling clothes. You know, you see people in big duster coats with packs on their backs. You know, this is not a, this is not somewhere people stay. These are people have got no interest in making connections here. You know, so your gremlins aren't making eye contact. They're not greeting you. They're not surprised that you're here. They're also not interested that you're here. They've got their own stuff to do. They've got a sign on this one building that because of the lack of investment and the kind of people that would set up shop in a border town hoping for the best, but not having the kind of money that would it would probably require to move to, say, Waterdeep and open a, a store there, they don't have that kind of infrastructure. So they just have a big sign on the front that has had several things crossed out. Yeah, it's been whitewashed and you can see two titles underneath it. And there's a different name on the window to there is on the sign. Several yeah. different layers People of paint. Yeah. A voice from the back room shouts, <laughs> we're closed. <laughs> <laughs> the gremlin makes an appearance again. I like that. Leprechaun submitted a forest in a windstorm. Okay. So you've immediately got so many like tactile things there you've got your clothes being blown about you your hair in your eyes you've got you know a deer runs past looking for shelter you know is this a natural windstorm is there a smell of lavender on the air as the fey creature at the center of this forest throws a hissy fit you know what the, a forest again can be so many different things is this you know think about think about a forest in you know that is just outside a suburb in a nice town versus something 300 miles away you know are the animals there used to seeing people around is it choked with poison ivy is there a path going through is if there's a path going through that means people go through here regularly enough to maintain a path if it's choked up with poison ivy people haven't been here for months you know or even years maybe you're trying to convey that you know things are getting bad and if you don't seek shelter they're going to get a lot worse. Absolutely. And this is where you can just, again, if you want to put, you know, if you want to put the fear of God into your players, unprompted after half an hour in this forest, you just say very matter of factly from behind your screen, I'd like all of you to take a point of exhaustion. Ooh. And you, you don't, you don't say why, you know, you don't say because it's so windy, you're getting tired. You say, I'd like you all to take a point of exhaustion. And your players therefore have to work out. They have to they have to engage with their environment. They have to go, oh wait, why is that happening? Oh yeah, we've just spent all day out in this forest when there's clearly a you know weather event going on. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't go outside in hurricanes. <laughs> so if they're outside in a hurricane, they need to pay attention to that. Your knife they need to think about what they're doing. is getting tired. You need to take a break. <laughs> 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 it's hard to walk on knives. <laughs> yeah, from from con trying to convey that there are freshly cracked and broken uh, large trees that were like healthy trees that are laying in the road and they're having to clear those out of the way to even hearing branches fall and get swept around in the distance. Like all of that stuff is ripe to just convey that this happens regularly, um, that these can fall huge trees yeah. that are very healthy like you need to gtfo i like that because a tree falling is one of the fright most frightening experiences i jordan have been through in my life so <laughs> that's very <laughs> visceral no doubt yeah if a redwood suddenly comes out of on its roots next to you that's a very different thing to it's quite windy in these <laughs> willow trees <laughs> these willows are a blowing well let's wrap this up with weapons we have Michelle, who submitted a fairy fire sword. 
On a hit, the sword sprays the target with fairy fire that lasts until the end of your next turn. And these weapons, I thought, were really interesting challenges to try to convey the spell in just mm -hmm. in encountering this weapon. Maybe it's just sitting, maybe it's actually being used. Yeah, so again, I think, as with monsters, you don't have to say, and as you hit someone with this, the spell fairy fire triggers, <laughs> you know, you can just, I have a house rule that if you think something is, you know, an, a magical object, you have to use an identify spell on it or experiment with it. I've never understood why sitting with something for an hour, just staring <laughs> at it in your hands, suddenly tells you, ah, yes, this is the haunted sword Bazarov. Um, you know, why I it will drink the blood of my enemies, but send me to hell. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Should have realized. It was written right here on the pommel. What, what are the classics of, uh, you know, if this is a, let's assume this is a world where magic weapons aren't a dime a dozen. You know, so is this, has this been, who has this been made by? You know, fairy fire as a spell, you know, that can be used for good or evil. Is this a finely honed elven blade with writing down it, you know, that says, you know, that has something cryptic in elvish? Is it a chunky orcish blade? You know, there's already, there's just, you can start there. And then, yeah, I think the obvious answers are see someone using it, you know, giving a villain a weapon that your players then want afterwards is always a great reason to have them kill that villain. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a blue, he's got that blue sword that I want. Um, so seeing it used on someone is obviously great. Um, and then you you go into the sensations again, you know, the 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 air, the heat of the in the air gets sucked out as this bright pink flame licks up the blade, and suddenly the goblin is engulfed in glowing flame. You know, anyone who's played DD can go, that might be fairy fire, but anyone who hasn't or doesn't care can just go, cool. Um <laughs> So I think, you know, I, I, everyone loves a riddle on the side of a weapon. Yeah. Everyone loves a kind of, you know, the dwarven runes that, that suggest something without saying what it is, you know. Yeah. Or it's called, you know, th this is the weapon ghost seer, you know, or something, you know, it can be baked into it that way. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Just kind of like tweaking the, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hit something and find out is my favorite way of introducing a weapon. Oh, for sure. And the final one uh, here is from Will HP, uh, and he says, this badly chipped and beaten bearded axe clearly belonged to woodsmen who did not know that it was designed for war instead of for felling trees. And I have to, oh, like, nice. my, my mind immediately goes to, like, the notches, even though it's clearly a wood axe, like if it's jammed into a stump where it's being used for like splitting wood. Of course it's jammed into a stump. Yeah. yeah. But then you've <laughs> got all of the, the notches for the number of, of people it's felled in its previous life as a war axe. I like it. I like it very much. It clearly has a handle that used to be wrapped in something, but now is bare wood. Yeah. You know, there's sort of, yeah, there's sort of, you the, Hinting at the previous life of things is great fun. A very quick tangent. I'm a huge fan of the Dark Souls video games. And one thing they do phenomenally well is giving the sensation that you are in a world that has been going on for millennia before you got here. In the Dark Souls games, I don't think there's a single boss you encounter who's at the height of their power. You're always meeting someone on the downswing of their existence and that's kind of why you're able to defeat them there's loads of wonderful so sort of beautiful tragic backstories that are all hinted at all implication but it works it really works that's very true those games are known for being very kind of lower light in a way while being extremely deep in the background you've got to read sort of the inscription on the inside of a ring that you find to you know that mentions a deity that's already dead because you know yeah, you don't. It's it's out there if you go looking for it. Well, that's very good. We want to hear more about you and your backstory and how you got all of these wicked skills. Uh, but I hope that that was helpful. If like if you've done anything like me and struggled with this in the past, or maybe done it and not understood why it works so well, or maybe you've leaned into show don't tell your entire DMing career, but 
I, I hope that these steps help as much as I think they've helped us because I now know what it is that I'm doing intentionally and I can lean into that instead of stumbling <laughs> through it blindly. But we want to ask you some more questions about uh, some of the projects that you're working on, Olo, and we'll do that in the Heroes Stage. This is the hero stage, where fantastic folk have a spotlight turned to them to tell the tales of their adventurous lives. Alo, let's let's talk about kind of your background and how it's changed and how it's created this obviously talented DM. Let's talk a little bit about your acting experience, because I'd love to, to kind of hear how you came to D&D from this acting background and how you think it's kind of changed the way that you play. Yeah, so I came to D&D relatively recently. I started playing about four years ago now, five years ago, maybe. Um, but I, yet, like my whole life, all the pieces were there. It's like to the extent that I'm really angry at everyone for not telling me about this sooner. <laughs> Like as a kid, you know, all my first sort of audio books were all myths and legends from all over the world. Always been a big board game fan. I, you know, when I was a teenager, I collected miniatures, I collected Warhammer. You know, I loved sort of did sort of the, the war games thing and got the bug acting wise around about 13 or 14. Went to university, did a ton more theater than work, unfortunately. Um, but kind of, and I studied literature at university as well. So kind of right through, and then I went to drama school where I became an actor. So my whole sort of secondary education has been about, <laughs> I'm realizing right now sitting here, um, working out why stories work and why they don't. Um, and I think this aspect, you know, particularly as a sort of, as we've got into the more modern world and our attitudes of psychology and stories not just being and then this hero went over here and hit this monster with a hammer and then went over there and hit that dragon with a hammer and then all the monsters had been hit with hammers and the legend was over um <laughs> you know as stories have become more person focused and more psychological i think that fits perfectly with what D D has done in terms of getting it away from that war games basis making it much more individual focused trying to get that psychology into it my acting career was weirdly mostly in not through any particular kind of decision but i fell in with a crowd that meant i fell in with a crowd kind of thing i did a huge amount of immersive theater lots of interactive stuff so look sort of long form improvisation within a story framework what does that sound like for people <laughs> at home um so D D was sort of a very natural fit once i found it my brother got me into it by showing me an episode of this like three hour long episode of something called critical role <laughs> where people at a table sort of just talked at each other for a bit and occasionally rolled dice and went <gasps> a 17 um so but then i eventually kind of played and obviously it all made sense and then went back and consumed all the D D I could forming that connection with an audience member or a player you know has sort of been a very natural part of my working life and actually, I'm not an actor anymore. And D and D kind of helped me quit, to be honest. Which is a, is a slightly weird story. A lot of I know a lot of people get into performance through tabletop gaming. But we had a teacher at school who always said, "I think the problem with acting is that it's it's one of the very few art careers where you can't just go and do it to blow off steam if you want to. If you're a dancer, you can go out dancing. If you're a musician, you can go home and play the piano for a bit. Or if you're a painter, you can go and you know throw some paint on a canvas." If you're an actor, you can't just go home and do some acting. That's that's not a way to engage with your passion. You've got to have someone has to let you do it. Someone has to employ you to go and be someone else for a bit. I mean, you can act at people on the street, but they're <laughs> they're probably going to call someone to. Yeah, yeah, you end stop. up on a watch list quite fast. <laughs> yeah, you know. Okay, mate, someone looking for you? Are they? Yeah, that happens a lot. No, I'm just um, an actor, please. <laughs> <laughs> please someone hire me um so kind of when i got into D D and realized this could be something to do with my spare time it was like okay peace i'm sort of out that's the build-up to where i am now and then in terms of tavern tales uh which is the fantastic project that i was brought onto by 
uh, Mike Pisani and Colin Heffernan, who you had on the other episode. Mike started DMing a game for me and my wife just after we moved to Chicago. And we hit it off and got closer. And, and Mike was doing Tavern Tales at the time and I think they just had someone drop out or something. They had most of the adventures written. They had those first. And he said, we need another writer. Um, you like writing, right? And I'm like, sure. And he said, okay, can you have us an adventure in a week? And I thought, yeah, okay. Uh, and so um, smashed something out for them. And it was great fun. And then off the back of that adventure, they needed a lot more work done on the book. And they said, you want to come back and build out the tavern NPCs and the circus stuff and all that thing. So I just sort of, I just kept doing more and more for them. And it was a blast, an absolutely wicked time. And so with that, uh, with that project, like you're credited as the creative and art director, what did that really entail? Like, obviously it entailed some writing, um, but what else kind of fell under your purview on that particular project? My sort of segment of all that was, yeah, I, so I wrote one of the adventures, one of the sort of NPC admissions you can go on, I was, ha what was quite fun for me was I was handed a bunch of character concepts. They had, they had the core crew who run the tavern, uh, so the skeletons of them, they were like, these are the names, these are their races, these are the kind of, you know, those are the sort of rough backstories of where we want to come from, but they weren't any more than two or three lines. So I built those up and sort of fleshed them all out into about a page each, which was a fun exercise to do, to, to work from someone else's concept and knit everything together. It was really fun. And then I, we had some, we have some local legends in the book who are character concepts suggested by some of our bigger Kickstarter backers. So I wrote those out as well, same sort of idea. And then also helped work as an editor on the book as well. So just making sure that the stuff that was coming in fitted together, you know, that the adventures, they were, they were, we found little points where, oh, okay, you want to do a, you're doing a story over there that has a null in it. We've got a null character now. So can we just put a little, can we weave those lens together? So there was fun bits of that, was going back to writers and going like, can we change this to, you know, what have you? Um, and just making sure the whole thing sat together. I also proofread the entire book myself to make sure everything was kind of in one voice because I'm not the only Brit on the writing team. So I had to take <laughs> out all the British spelling and make sure everything was kind of, you know, uniform. Um, Mike and Colin did a fantastic job coming up with their own iconography system, you know, for the book. And so we I, part of the help make sure all of that fitted together, came up with a bunch of the merch, a bunch of the merchants that are outside the shop. And so, so it sounds like this was largely tying this entire world together because that's one of the things that Jordan and I loved about Tavern Tales was just how each piece could stand on its own, but it all felt like it was a cohesive, 